welcome everybody. Hope you are all happy and healthy and well. Um, I want to wish everybody a, a very um, happy, very thankful Veterans Day. Um, it's an important, important holiday. I uh, hope any of you who are veterans are having a, a, a good day. And, you know, those of you who have, have loved ones or have lost loved ones, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about y'all. Uh, Chris mentioned our uh, symposium this weekend. Uh, it's going to be a really, really great symposium. Um, it's some of the people who have really inspired me as a horticulturist uh, from Jamaica Kincaid, who's really made me think about um, my role and, and the role of horticulture and agriculture in, um, in our uh, uh, daily lives and our communities, how they fit together. Uh, Dan Benarsik at Chanticleer, who has, um, uh, well, I'd say he inspires me, but I'm just not the designer that he is. So mm -hmm. I'm inspired. I don't know if I've, if I've been able to take what he teaches and put it into practice because he's so good at putting uh, plants together um, and, and, and many more. It's really a great group of speakers. Uh, uh, so I hope you'll, you'll join us. A um, couple other things I want to mention. Uh, for those of you um, who have uh, children or young neighbors or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or who are just young at heart, because we've had a few adults sign up, um, we do have a, uh, a holiday um, decorations um, uh, program, uh, holiday creations uh, program coming up in our children's programs. Um, and that's uh, uh, something where uh, we put together uh, some natural supplies and things like that, that people will come and pick up here at the Arboretum and uh, take home. And then we'll meet on Saturday uh, live and kind of our Elizabeth Overcash, our fantastic youth coordinator will um, kind of work, you know, show you how to, how to put things together and, and make some creations for, uh, you know, ornaments and decorations and things like that using natural materials. Um, it's great for any age. Uh, the, the younger the hands, the more they might need some some uh, more experienced hands to help them with tying knots and things like that. But it's a lot of fun, and it's all material that comes from here at the Arb, uh, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. The other thing I want to mention, just because I love it so much, are these grow boxes. And uh, I can't really see what what shows up on a screen, so we'll hope that this shows up. Um, this is a program that Elizabeth Overcash, along with uh, some folks from the university and 4-H have put together uh, where um, we send these boxes filled with tools and plants and activities and uh, magazine um, to people for a, a subscription service. And they, uh, uh, you can do, uh, kids can do activities at home. Uh, the one that's currently about to go out is um, is sold out. Um, that's pollinators and propagation. Um, the uh, the last two from this pilot program um, that'll go out uh, early spring and kind of late spring are getting ready to. They're online now and probably will sell out fairly soon. So if you think you know somebody who might be interested in that, um, it's it's a lot of fun. Okay. Um, I give a lot of these talks, many of you have seen a lot of them, and one of the questions I always get asked or one of the things I always get kind of teased about is, why don't you talk about plants that we can actually get? And so I'm here to tell you, every plant that I'm going to talk about today is available. Because every plant that I'm going to talk about today is in our online auction that's happening right now. So. Uh, if you, after, after this, or, you know, if you don't like looking at me um, during it, you can go to our website and uh, look for the, the little banner that says something about the rare plant auction. And if you go to that, you can see pictures of all of these plants. You can see um, some more information uh, from, about all the plants. Um, you can see their names. Uh, for parts of this, Chris is going to have to help me move plants and things like that. So he may not be available in the chat like he normally is. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about a whole group of plants first. Uh, these are all camellias. They're all variegated uh, camellias. Uh, 
Some of them less so than others. Um, although you can see it in a little bit older leaves. Uh, this is one called Kiku Curran, Kifu Curran, excuse me, Kifu Curran Beni Karoko. Uh, excuse my pronunciation. Um, this is a really lovely plant. It's got this kind of uh, lighter uh, margin to the leaf, uh, a little bit subtler um, than others. Uh, while we have Yergella, which has um, kind of a broad, wide leaf, real disti distinct on Yergella, this really wide leaf that's got a, a, a yellow, um, kind of creamy yellow uh, border to it. The odd, well, not the, I guess the odd man out, yeah, uh, is, is this one. Um, this is Kinsekai. This is a Camellia japonica variety rusticana. This one has yellow in the center of the leaves as opposed to all these other ones. And uh, we got Jeff Hamilton, uh, which I find very similar um, to your Gela, but it is different. Um, uh, the your Gela, I, the color on the, the full plant I like better than Jeff Hamilton. Uh, Jeff Hamilton seems to grow faster for me though, so. Um, you know, there are little differences. And then this last one, uh, Golden Phoenix. I went out, I was hoping it was gonna be in flower out in the garden today. Uh, I wanted to get a picture of it. Uh, it is not. Um, this is this is maybe the showiest of the, the uh, variegated uh, camellias we have um, in this auction. So you can look at the descriptions. They have different color flowers. Um, but what I really like about the variegated camellias is, you know, camellias, we grow them because they, they flower uh, during the late fall into winter to, to early spring. Um, all of these are, are camellia japonica, so they'll all flower from, uh, depending on the, the type, from, you know, December, January, February, maybe early March. Uh, so they really give you something to lighten up. Uh, the, the winter time, and that's why all camellias are great. And we have other camellias in the this auction, uh, just ones that we think are are outstanding. Uh, but when they're not in flower and they're in a shade garden, I find camellias just suck light out of the air. Um, they can be so dark foliaged, and they're beautiful plants, but somehow they can make a, a shady garden feel even shadier. And and sometimes, quite honestly, that's nice. Uh, but I like these variegated ones because when you plant them in a shade garden, uh, they light it up. They give four seasons of interest with the variegation, and then the, the flower is just a little bit extra on there. I'll start with those. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right, what next? All right, I'll go to a little creeping plant since uh, started with, with woody plants. And Chris, you tell me where it's best to hold these things. I'll, uh, you're doing good. All right. This is, believe it or not, a fern. This is Lemnophyllum microphyllum. A uh, little creeping guy. It grows as an epiphyte or a lithophyte grown on trees or rocks uh, in the wild. Um, you can see it's got filled with spores on the back sides of those leaves. Um, I picked this up at a little nursery in uh, California when I was out there for, I think it was maybe to give some talks. Uh, it just picked it up um, at a nursery. I really didn't think it was going to grow here at all. Uh, and for years, we kept it in the nursery. We didn't plant it out. Uh, we kept dividing it. We had uh, you know, quite a few more at, at one point. Um, but then we stuck it in the ground because we don't grow things just to have in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it made it through the winter. What do you know? Um, it's been growing out in the garden for about the past uh, four years. It's been through really cold temperatures. Um, it seems to do fine. Now, it grows about an inch and a half tall. So it's easy for it to get, um, you know, covered up with leaves in the garden, uh, that sort of thing. And it doesn't really like that. So I think it's best um, kind of, uh, I've got some natural areas in my garden uh, where uh, I have soil that comes up to the top of, of 
some some logs by a path and so I'll plant it right on top of there so it's almost growing like an epiphyte but it's actually in soil but it can creep over those logs uh, we have it in our lath house it does great in there um, I've actually talked to somebody who said they can grow this as an epiphyte uh, they have grown it as an epiphyte here in Raleigh um, they said it doesn't seem to grow much it just sits there but it but it lives um, which surprised me um, I just think it's it's the coolest little thing in a container. It's easy in a container, and it man, this thing will fill a container so fast. It grows much quicker in a you know in a bright pot uh, you know by bright window than it does um, in the ground. Even it seems like to me. Um, but I I would estimate in a few years, if you had this planted in a spot it liked, you would get a, a nice patch, maybe uh, 18 or 24 inches wide. Um, you could also use it in a terrarium or or something along those lines, but. Just this neat, neat little fern. Well, you've inspired people with this one, Mark. Uh, Rose has asked, what is the name? Can you say that again? Lemnophyllum microphyllum. Great. Marianne asked if it's shade or sun or both. Shade. Okay. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, um, uh, I forget who it was. Oh, here we go. Marianne asked what an epiphyte is. Oh, an epiphyte is a plant that grows on another plant. So, you know, in the tropics, you think of all the bromeliads and orchids, or if you go out to, uh, you know, coastal North Carolina, you got the um, Spanish moss hanging from trees or the resurrection fern, you know, that'll dry up and curl up on, on branches of live oaks. And then when it rains, it, it opens back up. Um, that's what an epiphyte is. And, and you know, it's, most epiphytes are from warm areas because they're sitting up high in, in trees. And uh, going back to the camellias, can you clarify the flowering season for Camellia japonica for, um, for Sandy? Well, the flowering season for, for Camellia japonica, they, they kind of classify them in early, mid, late season. Um, early season ones are generally, uh, you know, December, January, maybe some are as early as November, mid season, you know, January, February, and then kind of February, March for late season ones. And uh, we should have that information on the the site with um, the 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 auction site. I, to be honest with you, I don't remember. I couldn't tell you if your gala is an early or a late season um, flower going right off the top of my head. Okay. And uh, just one more question, actually, regarding the auction. Someone uh -huh. was asking: Is there just one plant of each in the auction? For the most, in the auction, there's just one plant of each, except for two different plants. We have two Shima Superbas, and we have two Cornus Wilsoniana White Jade. Uh, the two Cornus are different size plants. So small plants we will ship. When they start getting larger, we can't ship them. So those are only for local purchase. So we have a White Jade dogwood that will ship and one that we won't ship. Okay, so many great plants, so hard to choose. All right, now we've got these plants um, outside uh, so that they're, they're hardened off and, you know, ready to go into people's gardens when they, they get them, um, if they want. Some people like to grow small plants like these in containers for another year or so. Um, that's fine, you can do that. I'm a, I'm a plant it uh, kind of person. Um, and, uh, you know, something like this, I would have no problem planting. I like digging small holes, not big holes. But so this one is, is starting to, to get some fall color on it. It gets a, a nice burgundy fall color. This is a maple. Um, might be able to tell that from the leaf shape. Uh, it's, it's just getting near the end of the season for these deciduous things. This is a maple, Acer tonkinensi, um, the Tonkin maple. So, Collected this uh, seed last year, so this is this is a one-year um, old seedling of this plant. Um, actually, not in the wild. It was growing in the research uh, plots at Shanghai Botanic Garden, and we were there looking with an iris expert, looking at some irises that were being grown under kind of some spaced-out trees. And we're walking along, and so we're all looking down at these irises, and um, I just happened to look up, and there was this maple with these star-shaped leaves, almost like a sweet gum, 
but the leaves, the top surfaces were so dark green and so glossy. It just is absolutely the most distinct, uh, one of the most distinct maples I'd ever seen. And I had never seen uh, 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 Acer Tonkinensi before. Uh, <clears throat> apparently in some places where it grows, some of the Vietnam, the low elevation ones, it's really purple on the backsides of the leaves. These are not, these are, are green on the backsides. Um, and we were told these are plenty, plenty hardy. They shouldn't be any problem for us. Uh, haven't grown it um, over a winter yet. Like I said, we just, these are 2019 seed, uh, but uh, some folks here in the US and folks in China all seem to think that there would be no problem with this. Um, I trust that it's hardy so much that I planted it in a very um, kind of a key spot in my garden where I really want that foliage effect because uh, it was a beautiful tree. Uh, and as for height, it kind of varies across the species, but from what I saw, I would, I would guess uh, in cultivation, it's going to be uh, maybe 40, 45 feet tall. And the question from Joyce is, would it be okay to plant it in early spring? It would be great to plant it in early spring. That would be just fine. And Maggie just asked, in general, are maple seeds successful to plant? Okay. In general, are maple seeds successful to plant? Ah, such an easy question that's so hard. Um, so a lot of times with a maple, you get a maple, uh, take the seed and cut through that fat part on that maple samara uh, with a pair of pruners. A lot of times, especially with different species growing in the garden, those uh, seed will be empty. You can cut through, you know, a couple dozen of them. They'll feel nice and you know, thick and full. And just did this a couple of weeks ago um, out at Juniper Level Botanic Garden. We were looking at a maple and we went through and started cutting them all empty. You would have felt, thought that they were just as full and as can be, but they were all empty. So that's one thing. If you have good seed, if you're cutting through and you find good seed and you collect that seed, uh, I think it is best to get it off the tree while it is still slightly green and sow it immediately. They tend to come up quicker, quickest that way. They have kind of two seed coats. So the next best thing is to kind of um, yeah, do a kind of nick through that, um, you know, the fat part of the Samara, the maple wing, um, just barely or, or scratch it so water can get into it um, because it's got uh, a primary and a secondary seed coat. And sometimes um, they'll go through uh, multiple years of dormancy. So you sow it outside, it'll go through that first winter, nothing will come up, it'll go through the summer, and then the next winter they'll pop up. Um, but I find if you sow them really fresh, they, they tend to come up a lot quicker. And how about address growing a cultivar from seed, like any of the uh, Japanese maples? Sure, any of the Japanese maples, the cultivars from seed, um, what you're gonna get is who knows? Um, it could be something fantastic. It could be something pretty blah. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you get to know Japanese maples really well, there are some cultivars. Don't ask me which ones because I can't remember off the top of my head, but there are some that are known for their seedlings really doing a lot of strange, cool things. Um, I will just beg this of you. If you grow a lot of Japanese maples from seed and you find something new and cool, Make sure it's really new and really good. Grow it for quite a few years before naming it. There are just too many Japanese maples out there now, and I'm having starting to have trouble telling them apart because they all look kind of the same. So make sure it is truly distinct. Which is a great segue. <clears throat> if I can do this without knocking everything off. All right talking about new, losing them, new and distinct. So we're always looking at our plants. Um, you know, my wife says we, we ogle plants. We're a little creepy with our plants. Um, but out in uh, the garden, we noticed a little plant that had popped up, a syningia. Um, so this is a plant for uh, sunny garden. This is a, a, a Jesneriata, a, a um, African violet relative. And it was obvious that that Syningia, um, his parents had been, um, you know, doing their thing at night, uh, 
creeping from room to room. I don't know what, what you want to say. But it's completely different color than what we've seen before. Uh, I think it got named maybe coming into Halloween. So it's it, we named it candy corn uh, because it does kind of have that candy corn color. Um, we've been um, starting to bulk up numbers, but this is the first time we've offered uh, Syningia candy corn uh, anywhere. So, uh, you know, this will be the first one that, that leaves the garden. Um, so, uh, you know, should be pretty exciting. I don't have one yet. I've got the perfect bed for it. I love this color in. Um, but what you can expect from this, based on its parents, is it'll it'll kind of clump up and spread to form a really nice mass. Uh, the when it's um, a, mature, a more mature plant growing out in the ground, uh, these stems will probably be closer to uh, 24 inches tall and kind of arching over. It will flower for a long, long season. If you look here, these are all um, spent flower buds, uh, and it's still going strong. It'll basically go until frost. And hummingbirds love these Syningia flowers, absolutely love them. So it's a great uh, hummingbird magnet. I planted a bunch of Syningia because uh, back in the spring, when we first, when, when staying at home was gonna be fun and an adventure, uh, my wife started bird watching. And so I planted a bunch of Syningia so we would get um, hummingbirds in. And I told her that and um, she was shocked shocked when we had hummingbirds in our garden at these plants. I was like, I don't know, I don't know birds, but I know plants. So your first ever chance to have to, to get this in the um, in our auction. And I'll go on from there with another first. A plant which is so new that it just got named uh, the day before it went up for auction. This is a Malva viscous. Malva viscous um, uh, arboreus variety Drummondii. You may think of it as uh, the Malva viscous, sometimes called Turks cap lilies. You may think of it as uh, you know a shy hibiscus. It's in that same family, but instead of the flowers opening up and revealing that uh, big long uh, stigma uh, in the in the middle, they stay closed and kind of twirl, the petals twirled around and the stigma sticks out the end. Well, one of the best ones you can grow is Malva viscous arboreus uh, variety Drummondii Big Mama. It has larger flowers, it's more robust growing, and the flowers are vivid, vivid red. Well, we found a great sport on Big Mama. And because it's so showy, we've named it Mama Mia. Uh, you can see it formed flower buds. We have we ha we had one that flowered. It has those same big, big mama bright red flowers, but on great variegated foliage. Now this is brand new. Um, you can see some leaves that are mostly entirely green. This has a little bit of variegation. This has a little bit of variegation. You're going to want to watch out for um, you know it, it reverting and going all green. Um, so far, we haven't had them any that have really reverted, but with any with this splash kind of variegation, you never know. So you definitely want to uh, prune that out if you get parts that are all green. But you know, even with these green leaves here, the new growth is coming out. Starts kind of this um, lemon yellow and then goes to a uh, creamy white. It is just a riot of colors when it's when it's in flower. That that bright red. Um, but again, this is the first ever offering of this plant. In fact, it's so new that our label from the nursery just says Big Mama Variegated, doesn't have its new name, Mama Mia, on it. So mm -hmm. your chance to own that. And these will grow each year. They'll die back to the ground in the winter um, and grow again. All right. Go with a more woody plant. If you've, if you've been hearing me talk on these um, programs, um, I've, I've mentioned several times uh, evergreen dogwoods, how much I like them. Uh, there are a few of them. Cornus elliptica is, is one that's most widely in the trade, um, but Cornus hongkongensis is one that we're finding is even better. So it's basically an evergreen uh, Kusa dogwood. 
uh, flowers a little bit later in the season than our native flowering dogwood, but has the big uh, white bracted um, flowers and then big, uh, you know, one inch uh, fruits. So this is one, another one of those plants from 2019, uh, our collection. Uh, this was on, I think this was on Sanquinshan, uh, but I had to look at my notes to be sure because we collected a couple of these. Uh, we, um, we were up high on a mountain. It was a kind of a, a cool, uh, rainy day. And we saw these, um, the, this dogwood that had fruit on it. And it's pretty obviously a Hong Kongensis or, or something very close to that. Um, but definitely looked and acted kind of different. But we collected those fruits and we've grown out seed. And every one of the seedlings has very, very stiff foliage, much stiffer than any other Cornish Hong Kongensis I've ever grown. And it feels like um, sandpaper. Now, I've wondered, because it feels so much like sandpaper, there was a plant that was going around a while back called melanotrica. Trichomes are little hairs uh, on leaves, and melanin uh, means black, so they're little black hairs. Um, and they were supposed to be a little bit stiffer. Uh, and I'm wondering if maybe this doesn't represent that kind of subspecies or variety of Hong Kongensis, the melanotrica, but um, not quite sure yet. Um, at any rate, it is a fantastic plant. Um, it's very variable in the wild in terms of how edible the fruits are. They're all edible, how palatable the fruits are. Some are sweet, some are not. Um, I don't think this tree, we tasted any of the fruits, or at least I didn't. Uh, so I don't know if this one's gonna be sweet, but it is, it is quite strikingly different. Um, I really like it. I'm really excited to see what this is gonna look like growing and getting large in our gardens um, because it should be plenty hardy. It was growing way high up. Um, but just, I think it's going to look quite distinct from anything else that's that's out there now. And all the seedlings are very, very uh, similar. So really, really excited about this one. All right. The only plant in our program, in our auction, where if you buy one, you actually get three. You get all three. This is another um, little uh, uh, African violet relative. Uh, we think maybe it's a Charita. Maybe it's something else. Um, there are a lot of Gisneriads in China. And we're just getting to learn them and just figuring out how amazing they are. So this, what we're calling Charita, and this is from seed collected in 2017. So it's taken a while to even get this size for you. This was just a little, uh, little plant growing kind of on a, a crevice rock face uh, where it got water dripping down it. So it wasn't dry rock, but it was shady, kind of cool. Um, rock area and it just had little seed heads like this on it and I collected some seed and uh, it actually germinated which oftentimes these little jesnariads don't. Mm -hmm. It finally flowered this year and I'm hoping we can get it identified. It's a little pink flower um, but it's confusing me because its top lips are longer than short lips and I, its bottom lips and I'm not sure what just Nariad does that. But it's flowered for a long time in the nursery. And um, I don't know if you can see, this one's got new flower stalks coming up right now, little guy. Um, but it's, it's taken to growing in a nursery in, in a, very well, which a lot of these don't. The reason we're putting three in is one, because they're so small. Um, and we're hoping you bid a lot for it. Uh, but two, unless you have a rock face that has, you know, kind of regular moisture um, weeping over it and it stays, you know, fairly cool and whatnot, 
you will probably have to experiment with where these are going to grow best. Um, you could certainly grow them in a trough or something like that, um, a container. Um, you can um, plant it, you know, and plant them in a couple of spots in your garden. Uh, that's what we do. We, we put things out in a few spots to see where it's happiest in, in cultivation. Uh, I think this is going to like, um, if it can be somewhere, uh, like if you have a, a patio in, in the woodlands and you, you want to plant it out there. Sometimes I'll even just take two kind of decent sized pieces of, of some kind of thin flagstone and just set them in the open garden near each other for a plant like this. Plant the plant there and just kind of slide the rocks up underneath the leaves there. Um, and that kind of gives the plant what it was used to in the wild. Um, and I don't know, seems to, seems to make it easier for them to grow. Also keeps it from getting lost in the garden, which can be a problem with these little guys. Uh, very cool plant. Hope that whoever takes it home, if they have just wild, wild success with it, they let us know how, um, where they're growing it, how they're growing it and how it's doing. And if they get it positively identified, even better. Is that one new to the auction, Mark? I think Catherine's having a hard time finding its uh, bidder number. So it may be under Chirita, C-H-I-R-I-T-A. Um, it may be under AF Chirita, A-F-F, -F, because we're not 100% sure about that cultivar name. But if it isn't in there, we will add it. And we had a question going back to the dogwood. Oh, they, they did find it good. Uh, yeah, it's underneath Charita. Okay. And going back to the dogwood, um, someone asked, is it a tree? Yes, yes. Um, and actually, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. A lot of the Corn Cornish Hong Kongensis are, they're trees, but they kind of try to be a little bit shrubby. This really looked in the, out in the wild like a Kusa dogwood, um, much more of an upright single trunk tree and the way they're trying to grow in cultivation, again, like a single trunk tree. So yeah, a, a tree. Okay, for one that is not a tree, maybe hard to get in the um, picture, I'm not sure. You can get a little close up, there we go, that looks good. All right. Another wild collection from that same year, 2017, of a plant that I love, uh, which is mostly not seen in, um, in cultivation. It's Mersini Africana, and it ranges from Africa, kind of through the Middle East to Southeast Asia. This may be the hardiest form in the US because of where we collected it in 2017. Uh, we collected it in Gansu, so it's going to be very high elevation. Um, believe it or not, this shrub, it is a shrub, it, um, <clears throat> where I've seen it growing in the wild and where I've grown in cultivation, it makes about a three foot tall and wide kind of really graceful arching mound of this um, nice small foliage. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what it does, but it's in the primula family believe it or not, it's a shrub, but in the primula family. It, uh, there are separate male and female plants. The flowers aren't showy. If you have both male and female, uh, the female plants will get a uh, little kind of purple black berries, which is what I collect to get the seed for these things. Um, I've grown it in sun and shade. Uh, I think it's better in a bit of shade. Uh, we've grown it here at the Arboretum. Um, I, I think it's just a very cool plant. And while this looks like it's going up, it, you can start to see it's going to arch over and the branches are going to arch um, really graceful. Uh, I don't really know what to compare it with, uh, but I really like this plant. I just think it's, it, it, it's funny. It's for a plant with little green leaves. Um, if I'm in the wild or if I'm in a garden and I see this, I immediately know what it is. It's, it's something about it is very, very distinct to me. So for whatever that's worth, um, but cool plant and probably the only one in your neighborhood with it. All right, let's get off of something that I, not something my wild collected. Okay, I've been growing this at the Arboretum for a while. Um, actually, I've grown this under a couple different names. Uh, this is 
Uh, Pittosporum tobira, uh, the, the Pittosporum that's most widely grown around here. This is one called Spring Bouquet. Um, we also once had it as Dr. Yakoi's ghost, uh, but uh, I don't think Dr. Yakoi appreciated that name. Um, so this is an evergreen shrub, um, has white fragrant flowers, uh, but what I love about this um, is uh, the new growth comes out pure white and then kind of goes to kind of speckled green white and then goes completely green and it's evergreen. So right now I went out and looked at our plant in the garden to see how much variegation is still on there. It's mostly green, um, but this spring it's going to flush out new growth like this. The whole plant will be look like it's um, uh, covered in flowers, and that's actually where the name came from. Uh, Ted Stevens at Nurseries Carolina uh, said when he saw it um, uh, in growth, he thought it was a bunch of flowers. He thought it was a whole bouquet of flowers, like just all these white flowers. Um, didn't he realize it was a live plant? Um, incredibly striking when it when it flushes out that new growth, and that lasts for. Um, just weeks and weeks and weeks, much longer than uh, a flower will last. So we'll make a nice evergreen shrub though. Um, we grow it in a little bit of, of shade. Uh, haven't tried it out in full sun. Um, it, it may color up even better in full sun, but that really white foliage may just burn um, as it transitions from spring into summer in, um, in full, full sun. So Daniel had a comment that ended in a question mark. So I guess it might be a question. Okay. Um, he says that um, Pittosporum tubera is a zone seven B plant. Yes. Mark. Yes. There you go. And, and we do have, have the zone information to the best of our knowledge on, um, on the auction. So, um, you know, Raleigh is pretty solid 7B at this point. Um, <clears throat> we haven't had problems with, with this at all. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Two separate plants. But these are Maybe the same thing, but I don't think they are. Um, these are two holly ferns, Sertomium. So you probably know holly ferns, probably grow some holly ferns. Uh, these are two from uh, 2018, collected pretty close to each other on Leaping. I think these were from Leaping. Uh, which was where uh, I saw uh, uh, paper bark maple uh, in full fall color uh, for the first time ever with nothing but empty seed pods. We were talking about the maple seeds. We, we collected a bunch, none of them were good. So this one I collected was, was growing on a, on a slope uh, like holly ferns often do in the wild. And it was just one or two um, fronds, but they were very, very wide and very broad, um, very blue-green. And this, this particular frond is starting to get that characteristic that it had. Uh, it was really pretty. Um, if I was more of a fern expert, I'd probably have been able to figure out what it was. As it is, we're going to have to wait till these mature a little bit more um, to really figure them out, start getting spores on them and that sort of thing. But I liked it a lot. Holly ferns are great. Um, these will be should be perfectly hardy for us at zone seven. Um, you know, evergreen, uh, great ferns, and of course, deer don't touch the ferns. Um, they won't eat the ferns. Which I should say about those um, those variegated camellias. Deer do like variegated camellias. <laughs> so if you get a small one, you might want to cage it for a few years. I have some great variegated ones, including that Yergella. The deer tend to go in there and eat them early in the season and kind of pinches them back and they flush out. I get that bright variegation later in the season. It looks good. My plants are, are nice and tight and dense. I don't mind it so much, but at four inches, they may eat the whole thing. 
So this was a different holly fern. Um, wow, this one's already getting ready to spore. It's, it's getting um, close to, to maturing. Um, this was a, a nice vigorous one. It had fronds about maybe, oh, 20 inches long and, and fairly nice and wide, but the, the individual pinnae or leaflets, frondlets, um, were not as wide as, uh, or the terminal, not as wide as the, the one I showed just before. But other characteristics, very much the same, and it could have been a matter of how they were growing or just a little bit of, of um, uh, you know, variation. Uh, I do think they're different. The other one seemed to always grow with just, just a couple of fronds, whereas this had, had many more fronds, more typical what we think of um, with a, a holly fern. But, both should be easy and really, really pretty. All right, I say I didn't. I didn't save one of the very best for last. Uh, this is a plant that makes my cold little heart go pitter patter pitter patter pitter patter this is a sorbus or mountain ash that we collected in 2019 uh sorbus dunii it made a small tree to about 10 feet tall kind of a bluish uh, green foliage and then the backs of the leaves just like pure white oh that's so nice Fruit, when we collected it, was uh, kind of a, a pinky red. Um, mountain ashes typically don't do very well for us, uh, but uh, this was growing in an area where everything was were things we can grow. They were hollies and erysemas and acerums and, oh, camellias and I, just everything there. So I think this is going to be good for the South. Um, I've seen one that's been planted outside uh, from the same collection that's looking amazing now after, after the summer. Um, I brought this out. We actually have a slightly larger one uh, that, may, that I think will probably be the one that we actually send to the winner um, of this, uh, of this uh, plant. Um, we only have a few plants though, uh, and we, we've got a hold most of them, hold them for ourselves. But we do have one that's probably three times the size of this that I think is what we will actually uh, give to the winner of the auction. When I was pulling plants, I was, I was a little miserly with this because of what it does to my cold heart. Um, but, uh, but we will, I think I will part with our largest uh, plant. Um, should be white flowers. We haven't seen it in flower yet. Um, it's going to want full sun, I, I think. Uh, some mountain ashes do better in some shade. This one's, I think, going to want as much sun as it can get. Uh, yeah, good plant. So our bigger ones in a maybe a gallon container, three quart or a gallon container. Uh, but this was from Jangingshan. No, Sinquanshan. Sinquanshan. Any questions? You just answered the question without even knowing it. So where was it from? Yep. Sanquishan, which was one of my favorite collecting places in recent years. It had so many non-spiny hollies, which I really like. I like the hollies without spines all over them. And so be prepared in the next uh, coming years. They, th those hollies can be slow from seed, um, but I hope we'll have some more of those, some really good ones. So this is a plant uh, from our friends at Moore Farms Botanic Gardens in South Carolina. Uh, this is a beauty berry, Calicarpa. Um, Calicarpa more purple, I believe. Uh, it's a hybrid. It's obviously a hybrid with our native um, Calicarpa americana. Uh, but then it's got something else in it. I think it's, uh, it looks to me like it's a hybrid between Calicarpa americana and Calicarpa mexicana, the Mexican um, beauty berry. The, the uh, clusters are held very tight, 
But rather than having the really dark, almost black or burgundy um, fruit, it has much more the, the purple coloration. And let me tell you, um, I don't know how it shows up on the video camera, but under these um, fluorescent lights, they are not doing these berries uh, any great service because this is a wow plant when, when you see it. So it'll make a upright shrub. Um, I would guess that it's gonna be six to eight feet tall based on the Americana uh, parentage. Uh, lavender flowers um, followed by these berries. It'd be interesting to see whether the birds like these because the birds don't like Calicarpa Mexicana very much, but they love Calicarpa Americana. Um, also something, if you've heard a lot of my talks, you know, I've talked about that uh, you can use Calicarpa Americana, the American beauty berry. Um, you can take the leaves and crush them and rub them on your skin and it works like uh, deep woods off. Um, but I don't know if this hybrid will. But you can see just on this little thing, you can see what it does in terms of flowering and fruiting. So imagine that on a big plant. And if it gets too big for you, you just cut it back and over the winter and it'll re-sprout for you um, and it will flower and fruit on that new growth. So no problem there. Um, some people cut them back every year uh, and that would be fine. I wouldn't cut it back this winter, but next winter I would. Um, but really, really neat plant. Well, that looks like it might be holding on to the berries, like the Mexican one does, yeah, which is a native one. Exactly. I mean, I've, well, this has been moved from a greenhouse to the front of the greenhouse, so they would know to pull it for the, the auction. It's been moved into uh, an outdoor space in the auction. I, I pulled it up here, and it's it's lost almost no fruit. So, yeah, it holds on to the fruit really well. I don't think I even seen one on the desk. There's one in the pot. Uh-oh. All right. One here. All right, this is one we have offered before. Um, this is a variegated form of the Japanese clethra. We have a native clethra, clethra alnifolia, um, but this is the uh, form clethra barbinervus, Takeda nishiki. Uh, absolute showstopper of a plant. It's a deciduous shrub, so we'll lose these leaves. Um, comes out uh, really, um, you know, almost white with pink highlights and just little speckles of green. Over time, a lot of times the green, you'll get more and more green in it, um, the older foliage. Uh, I have grown this plant for years and have seen maybe one or two reversions in it total. It is such a, a good, reliable plant for me. It also is, for a plant that is this variegated, is, uh, is, is quite a quick grower. Um, really um, grows pretty well. Uh, it's been a little bit shy to flower, but ours in the Arboretum, our big one is starting to, to flower now. You get um, a fragrant little um, kind of arching spikes of these small white flowers. Uh, it's, they're nice, they're fragrant, which is good. They're not so showy against this foliage. Um, but but they're they're nice. Um, the young stems are often kind of reddish, so even when it loses its leaves, it's it's very nice. Typically, Clethra barbinervus grows up into a really wants to be a small tree. Uh, Takeda nishiki has seemed to want to be a little bit lower um, and not really go up quite so quickly. Uh, but awesome plant. I mean, hard to beat that for um, color. A little bit of shade best for that. All right. I don't know. Maybe maybe I got to <laughs> hold on. Let me instead of doing this one, let me do this one and then I'm going to stand up for the other ones. How's that? Yep. I just have to look at the collection number to see where, where it was collected. Oh, yeah. So um, we do like our uh, cast iron plants here. Uh, Cast iron plants are great outdoor plants. They're great indoor plants. The only living plant in my office is a cast iron plant. Um, Chris occasionally uh, has feels so bad for the plants in my office. When I put house plants in my office, he will sometimes come in and water them. He's been working from home for the last eight months. So uh -oh. we even had to take the plants out of his office and put them in the greenhouse. Um, but but they are great plants for shade. They're evergreen. Um, they're tough as nails. Uh, they're just 
really rock solid plants. So this is a species, Aspidistra zongabea, uh, that we collected in 2014 on um, uh, Imeshan, the sacred Mount Ome in um, Japan. Uh, we're, we don't have a name on it other than Aspidistra zongbei. We call it um, uh, striped and spotted because it's got both stripes that you get on some um, Aspidistra and the spots that you get on others. Um, it's got them both on there. That is something that happens with some frequency on Aspidistra zongbei. Um, there are some other ones, Yunnan sunbeam uh, out there. But um, I really like it. And this, this species has a reputation for being uh, slow to, to bulk up, but this particular one has been quick for this, this, uh, for Aspidistra zongbea, which is small, com slow compared to some other ones, but I really like it. Doesn't get too tall. It's about, um, I get maybe a little bit taller than this, but as it gets taller, it tends to have the leaves, uh, start laying over a little bit more. So it really shows off that color um, grade. It's, it's nice for putting up along the edge in a, a woodland garden, um, you know, in another shady spot like that. Uh, when the old leaves, you know, from a couple years before start, you know, getting brown tips and looking ugly, you just cut those out, um, you know, over the winter or in the spring uh, and uh, to keep it looking nice and fresh. But in a mild winter, you won't need to cut anything out. If we have a really cold winter, you'll get damage on a lot of the, the leaves. Um, I usually like to wait for new leaves to start coming up a little bit before I cut them back, but I don't know why that is. That's just me. Any questions on that one? Cutting back for the new leaves, that was yeah. uh, Judith Tyler's recommendation because they are bigger than. Right, yeah, that's, that's right. Judith Tyler said if you, um, and this is especially true for Aspidistra aladior, um, but I would assume it applies to all of them. If you cut back the old leaves too early, the new leaves coming up will be shorter. If you, if you let the new leaves come up to about halfway as tall as what their ultimate height should be before you cut back the, the old leaves, um, your plants will get bigger. There was one calicarpa berry there. Uh -oh. This work stand up. Yeah, yeah, you're good. All right. In, in case y'all didn't notice, I've got, I've got, you know, because it feels like we're in a tropical rainstorm <laughs> outside. I'm wearing a tropical shirt, but it's also because I knew I wasn't going to have a Zoom background because this shirt and a Zoom background do not do well together. I start looking <laughs> like a floating head. Um, you know, I think about you people when I'm when I'm getting yeah. dressed in the mornings. Uh, so this tall guy is actually a strobilanthes. Um, strobilanthes, you may know from uh, Persian Shield, that beautiful um, foliage plant with the silvery and purple leaves um, that, that hmm. sometimes people use um, for, for summer annuals, for big displays. Um, mostly not hardy, strobilanthes. Um, this, we are told, is a hardy form. We have not tried it over winter. It's Strobilanthes hamiltoniana. I would probably not plant it outside its first winter. I might take cuttings on it, pluck off the flowers and take some cuttings and root it. It should root really easy. Just put it in some potting soil, keep moderately moist and it'll, it'll probably root for you. Um, and then plant it out in the spring. Um, this has just been grown in the greenhouse from cuttings. That's why it's so, so tall and skinny. Um, normally you'd have a bunch of stems coming out. Um, let's say you plant this uh, in the spring, it comes up, you'll get multiple shoots coming up out of here. Cut it back, you know, the next year it dies back to the ground, have even more big, like kind of a, almost looks like a three foot shrub, but it'll be a dieback plant. Think like a, a, a Baptisia or something like that. But then it gets, for just ages and ages, from midsummer on, it gets these big purple tubes. Uh, grow it in some high shade, probably, for best results. That's a guess, just looking at it. Looks like something that would like prefer a little bit of shade, um, fairly moist soils. Uh, but cool. Um, it's come back for years in Aiken, South Carolina, which is a little bit warmer than us. Um, they're a good zone eight or seven B, but 
I think with some good mulch on there, I think this will come back just fine. Plant it out in the spring, though, if you get this. Don't plant it out right now, unless you like to really live on the edge. But look at this. These are all flower buds. This, is, this thing is just loaded with flower buds. Imagine, you know, 10, 20, 40 stems of this just all in flower, just a big dome of flowers. I'm sure butterflies or hummingbirds or somebody likes those flowers. I, I think this is very, very cool. It looks ideal for hummingbirds. Yeah, yeah, it really does. All right. Is it better for you to grab plants or for I, me to I'm go grab them? Grab them. Want to do the uh, tropically looking ones next? Sure. Yeah. All right. All right. I think my least well attended midweek with Mark, perhaps, was one called uh, Aureliaceae I Have Loved or something like that, <laughs> where I talked about plants in the Aureliaceae family. Well, I still love plants in the Aureliaceae family. So we have got some rare, rare stuff for you right now. I'm going to start with the rarest. OK, you look at this, and what do you see? You say, fatsia, right? And I say, you're right. This is a fatsia. Uh, 18 years ago, I would have told you with some confidence that there was one species of fatsia, and it was fatsia japonica, the Japanese fatsia we know and love. And then about that time, I learned that there was a species in, in um, Taiwan called Fatsia polycarpa, which we have since gone and collected and um, are really working to get it in cultivation. And then this spring, uh, we were interviewing for a plant um, breeder for the Arboretum. And uh, he was talking about some work and he mentioned Fatsia Oligocarpella. Oligocarpella? Oligocarpella? I need to figure out what that oligo means in Latin. I don't know that. And I thought, there's a fatsy I don't know. I must have this plant. And so I immediately hooked into my network of botanical friends and found one place, one place in the country that I could track down that had this plant, Fatsia oligocarpella. Now, it is from the Bonin Islands of Japan, which are, you know, mostly south of Okinawa. So there are some things from that area which are hardy for us. I am guessing this is probably not. So unless you, you, if you bid on this, unless you're very brave, grow it as a house plant. Fatsia make great house plants, but when it gets big enough to propagate, propagate a piece, they propagate pretty easily, and then plant your old plant in spring, plant it out in a good spot and see if it lives um, and let us know. We have three of these plants. We are auctioning one. That means we will have two. And trust me, we'll keep track of who we gave one to, who, who gave one, who we, uh, uh, who won it in the auction. And if both of ours die, we're coming to get a piece off of yours. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm hoping maybe there's some hardiness in it. We will see, but it's great. For, it's botanically interesting anyway. And um, until we start propagating ours and getting them around to some other people, um, I can guarantee you're not going to find this anywhere else. So, Fatsia oligocarpella. So Sarah cool. commented that it means without or absent. So no seeds. Oligo, it, carpal yeah. is, um, you know, seed or fruit. Yeah. fruit. So maybe it never seeds. Yeah. Might be why it's so rare. <laughs> Who knows? I will say this, speaking of Aureliaceae, one of my uh, one of my Schefflera species that generally doesn't do well here. I think I may if 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 freeze holds out long enough, I may get uh, ripe fruit on it. Mm. So if I do, 
Um, you'll be seeing that. Now this, you might say, looks a little like a fascia. It's a little like a Schefflera. Looks a little like neither. This is a Brassiopsis. Brassiopsis are really known for, many of them do this thing where it's, it's like they're a palmate leaf, except for they go down almost to the, the vein in parts. And so you'll get kind of this circle with these lobes on the outside of it. Very weird. This is Brassiopsis mitis. Uh, this is, you know, I think of this as a cross between Fatsia, Schefflera, and Aurelia. And I say Aurelia because it has uh, spiny stems. These are, this is a thorny, thorny, vicious stem. Now, I would say that there, I would have said that probably no Brassiopsis are hardy. I have walked right by these plants in China and not collected them. Uh, but I am told from the person who, who I got this from that this has survived uh, well, well below freezing out in the open in container in Europe. You know, I don't know how Europe's freezes compare to ours, but um, it, he says, he says it's this particular one is pretty hardy. Just recently I was in North Georgia um, you know, kind of higher elevations, kind of where, you know, pretty similar to what we have. And lo and behold, they were growing a, a different species of Brassiopsis outside there that has been through a couple of admittedly mild winters. Um, so maybe hardy, but expect this to kind of grow up with the, the spiny stalk, um, not to do a whole lot of branching unless you cut it back, but have these really weird leaves. Again, you know, buyer beware. We don't know if it's hardy. Uh, you may be best growing this as a house plant. Certainly would not plant it out this fall. I would wait until spring if you're going to plant it out. This is another plant that we only have three of, and we've already promised one of them to somebody else. So that's going to leave us with one. So if you get this, take care. We got an update from Sarah. She said it also means few or rare. Few or rare yep. or none. Yeah, we'll take that. Rare seeds. <laughs> All right. So in the auction, we have two other fatsias, uh, two forms of uh, fatsia polycarpa, the Taiwan fatsia. One is a little guy. He's in a little pot, you know, one of our little three and a half inch pots. And that's a cutting from our plant in the lap house that has been the best one that we've grown from our 2009 collection. It was very pretty. Uh, finely divided leaflets. This is one we got in Cornwall uh, in the UK that is not, um, that we haven't had out during a cold winter yet. This is one we just call uh, Shitu giant form. These are seeds off the plant uh, at uh, Tregane in, in Cornwall. And they do definitely, um, as they've been growing, they seem to have larger leaves, these seedlings do, certainly than any of the other polycarpus we've grown. The parent plant had leaves that were uh, almost three feet across. Uh, they were huge. They were calling it mega fatsia. Um, it, was, it may or may not have been one of the only reasons I really had to go back to England um, <laughs> was to get my hands on that plant, uh, why I had to go back in spring. Um, taking a tour to the Chelsea Flower Show was, uh, leading a tour there was great, but afterwards I went to Tregane to get the seed of this plant. Um, expect it to become, if it survives, um, we don't know how hardy it'll be, but if it survives, expect it to come a big beefy plant. We have planted a, quite a few here at the Arboretum in different spots. Uh, they have all survived over the winter, but last winter was not very cold. So if we have a cold winter and they all survive, you know, two thumbs up, uh, but we shall see. Um, but but Fatsia makes a great house plant too, um, you know, and you can keep it in a pot and move it in and out. And when it gets too big, just plant it out in the garden. Um, and again, Fatsia root easily. So you could whack off a big old honking chunk of it like this, stick it in a one gallon pot and root it just like that and you'd be fine. Um, 
you know, and plant the rest of it. That's, that's often what I do um, with plants like this and begonias. I'll bring a piece in for the winter and then leave the rest of it out in the garden. You want to say the name again for that one? Sure, this is Fatsia polycarpa shitu giant form. What's next, Mark? Whatever you want to give me. All right, I'm going to start going through them fast. So put a few of them up here. All right. Okay, one of the absolute most beautiful pines um, you can grow is this Pinus roxburghii. Um, these are seedlings, and we're never sure if we're getting the right, the true thing um, until they come up. But indeed, this is uh, the true Pinus roxburghii. And you can see that silvery blue glaucous foliage, um, just gorgeous. This would become a, a large tree, um, a good pine. Uh, it's, uh, the needles will get fairly long on it as well. Um, it's uh, one of those, plant, those pines that's almost never offered. I mean, who's, who's growing this kind of thing? You got to grow it from seed. Um, and nurserymen aren't doing weird pines very often. So uh, it's one of your only chances to get it. I really like it. Should be fine out here in, in Raleigh. Um, yeah, it some sun. You definitely want to pet it. I was going to say, it looks like it's very soft. It is. It is. Very cool plant. All right. Uh, Chris said next week I'm going to be talking about um, the other camellias and camellia relatives. Uh, this is one such relative. This is a polyspora. Um, polyspora is closely aligned with Gordonia and Franklinia, if you're familiar with those. Um, they have white flowers with yellow stamens in the middle. Uh, we have quite a few polysporas and shimmas in the sale, most of them pretty good size. Uh, this is one of the smaller ones. Now, this is one called Polyspora heinanensis. If you know Heinen, the Heinen Islands, you know those are kind of subtropical islands. Uh, so this is probably going to be maybe the least hardy of the ones that we are, are auctioning. Um, I doubt it's going to be hardy here. You never know. I haven't grown it, so I won't you know, say it won't, but probably not. But it'll make a nice, you know, green tree uh, as a house plant. Uh, I don't know how young they start flowering. Um, looks like this is a rooted cutting, so it may flower at a young age. Um, so you may get those those white flowers on it indoors. Um, you know, it's an auction, so if any of you are joining us from, you know, farther south, uh, maybe worth uh, trying down there. Um, you know. I'll try anything in the ground. So we kept, we have one of these and we'll, we'll stick it in the ground next spring and, and, you know, see what it does. Uh, but just a cool plant and all of them are great plants. All the, um, Shima superbas and sinensis and, uh, polysporas and gordonias and, um, all those we have in the auction. Okay. And now for something different, a platinus, uh, this is, an. uh, Arizona, southwestern um, uh, Mexican plant. Uh, uh, well, yeah, mostly Arizona. Um, Platinus ridei. So you know our native Platinus, the sycamores. This is an Arizona sycamore. Um, it's got these very deeply divided leaves, um, quite different from, from ours. Uh, I've been told it doesn't get uh, it doesn't get the um, uh, anthracnose rust on there that ours gets. Um, doesn't get that much, but um, it's just a cool looking plant. They get big, they get good looking bark. Uh, you know, you don't want to put this in if you have a tenth of an acre lot, but if you have a little more space, um, uh, maybe one that's open, that's, you know, got a spot that starts to get wet or is wet certain times, uh, this would love it there, although it will take it very dry. Uh, Again, you'll be the only one in your neighborhood. Uh, and who doesn't like that? Um, but neat plant, I think, um, underknown, underutilized, they grow great out here. 
that foliage looks very clean compared to what uh, typical sycamores look like. And yeah. it also looks like it's maintained them versus dropping them off like so many of them do. Oh yeah, this has summer. been great. And this is in the, you know, the greenhouse is not a happy place for sycamores. <laughs> and this was in a crowded hoop house um, and looks, looks fantastic. Yeah. Could make a nice landscape tree. Yeah, and I would bet if you planted that, um, I would think by this time next year, uh, it would be five or six feet tall. Easy. Okay, another tall one. This one I won't say is a wild collection, but it is from Japan. This is Diasporus cathayensis. Uh, Diasporus cathayensis. This is a um, a uh, help me out. Persimmon, um, uh, an Asian persimmon. Uh, we collected this, the fruit at uh, the University of Tokyo's Botanic Garden, Kwishikawa Botanic Garden. Uh, it makes kind of a, a, a twiggy, upright um, plant with really showy um, kind of maybe one inch, one and a half inch orange fruit all over it. It will sucker a bit and form kind of, of um, uh, patches, uh, but it's worth it for when you see all that orange in there, you just decide how much space you wanna give it and let it go. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's gonna be really easy. It grows about 12 feet tall. Uh, you know, we, we saw this plant, um, we saw it, we were, must have been, you know, 30 yards away from it when we saw it and we, Kind of stop saw like oh, what do we, we got to get we got to get that we got to see that what is it what is it um i've grown diosporus cathayensis before um it's an easy plant it'll take some shade uh it'll take very dry soils um the worse the soils are the less it it suckers but it will sucker this one's already starting to sucker a little bit but that's okay the birds love nesting in those thickets it makes so good for that all right, another kind of lanky thing that nobody knows what it is. People probably, probably hadn't gotten a single bid on it. Uh, this is one, um, we were talking, uh, for those of you who were joined us before we actually got started, um, uh, somebody who's joining us from Oregon mentioned uh, that she watched a sh uh, somebody from the Carolinas, North and South Carolina are different places, just so you know, out there in Oregon. Uh, but one of our colleagues from South Carolina, Patrick McMillan, who was at the South Carolina Botanic Garden, um, Clemson's Botanic Garden, uh, has one of the most amazing collections of Southwestern plants anywhere. He has really developed this great, or at least east of the Mississippi. And this is one of those plants, Aloysia, Gross, gratissima, Aloysia gratissima. And we grow another Aloysia um, out here, but this makes kind of this upright, again, twiggy shrub, almost, it's, it's almost not woody, but it, it is. Um, but it makes just these, these upright vases of, of kind of fine foliage, very open, so it doesn't block a lot of light, which is nice in the garden. And it is topped for months with these spikes of very fine, delicate uh, white flowers. It is so pretty in flower. Um, and, and the, the uh, pollinators just were covered, covered this thing up. Um, I'd never seen it before, never heard of it until he showed it to, to, um, to me and, and Tony Avent. And uh, we both said, can we get cuttings please? <laughs> um, so we're letting you have this plant. Now, I, if I got this plant, if I win this in the auction, I would come in um, and I'd just chop it off right there so it can reflush uh, next, next spring. Um, but give it sun in a well-drained uh, spot and it should be fine. Uh, I really, I think this is a plant that's, I think it's sometimes you find plants that you think, you know, the, the people who really know plants are gonna start getting into this thing. Um, I think this is one. Doesn't look good in a container though, so that's that's a downside, but it is a really good plant. Um, we also mentioned that that Patrick McMillan is now the new director at our West Coast uh, uh, sister institution, um, Heronswood Botanic Garden. So um, really excited about that 
for all of us. We got a couple of questions going back oh, to the yeah. persimmon mark. Yeah. Chris asked, um, is the fruit astringent? Have you tasted it before? Um, I want to say it's not. It's also, you know, the fruit is inch, inch and a half, and the seed is three quarters of an inch. <laughs> So not worth the effort, even if I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing you 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 know, you're not going to sit down with a bowl full of it, but you know, you can pluck them off the tree and kind of munch on it in the garden. I I I cannot remember for sure if it's astringent. I don't feel like this one was. What it didn't seem like it was a named variety, but I don't believe it was a named. Uh, I don't believe it was astringent. Okay. I want to say we cleaned them in the hotel. And we also had an anonymous question wondering if it will grow in Transylvania County. Transylvania County. I think that one might be out west. Yeah. I don't know how cold that is. Um, I, I first Cafe Ensis, I want to say is hardy into zone six, but I'm not certain of that. Certainly all the way through zone seven. There you go. I think that should help out with the question then. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Chris just said mountains west of Asheville. Yeah. It might. I don't know. <laughs> That's a problem with these plants. If they haven't been grown there, we don't. Mm -hmm. We we just don't know. Um, all right. I mentioned you know the other camellias. This is uh, Shima sinensis, uh, the Chinese Shima. Um, Again, think Gordonia makes a, a tall, upright tree with white flowers, uh, yellow boss of stamens in the middle. Those have relatively small flowers. Oh, I just put it up. I always thought of, of shimmas as kind of medium sized trees, but I've seen really old ones in the woods uh, in Asia and they're, they're massive. They're, you know, two or three people can't put their arms around them. So, um, you know, put this in a spot where you want a really big tree in 150 years uh, mm -hmm. to make sure um, it has time to grow. Uh, they must not like the wood on it or something. It must, the wood must not be very good because it'll all be second, third, you know, growth forests. And then there'll be uh, a shimmer that's, um, you know, got six foot diameter. So I don't, I don't quite know why that is, but yeah. very cool. Um, Evergreen relative of, of camellias. Okay, getting down to the, the end. All right, another one I've mentioned in previous talks. This is one of our introductions. This is uh, Acer Levigatum Hong Long. Uh, new growth comes out just dark burgundy red. And then if it's grown in, in enough sun, the foliage gets kind of blue green. Uh, the young stems are really dark burgundy. It is evergreen until it gets um, down in the low teens and then it starts dropping leaves. We've grown it for years, hasn't been, um, it's been just fine out in the garden. Um, it's, I, I love this plant. I have people stop at my house and ask what it is this year because I have a young, young plant, not much bigger than this. It was actually this big and then it flushed out late uh, uh, some growth that's about this tall that just was shockingly red but i think even that late growth is going to harden off just fine um so an evergreen maple from the arboretum i think you can't beat that mm -hmm. oh right which first which first i'll leave the palm for last odd man out okay one more of our wild collections um this is a viburnum glomeratum subspecies Magnificum, and with a name like that, you know it must be good, um, right? Uh, this is a big viburnum. You could grow this, you know, these are single trunk. They grow as shrubs. You could actually grow this as a very attractive tree. Um, it is deciduous, great big leaves once it gets going. Um, it uh, kind of fuzzy stems, fuzzy everything. Um, and the terminals, uh, when it's mature, 
it'll form a flower bud. We actually have one that's a little confused out in the garden, one of these um, that's uh, opening up, the flowers are opening up, but they're big flower bud clusters. Think of, you know, leather leaf viburnum, something like that. So they open up to white, um, clusters of flowers, maybe six inches across. Individual flowers are relatively large for a, uh, that type of flower structure. Um, and then uh, it, it forms fruit, and the fruit are just glossy, glossy, bright red and big fruit. This, this um, Magnificum lives up to the name. And let me tell you, this thing, there was only a handful of fruit on it, and it was on a plant that was out over a ravine. And, you know, this was, this was one of those situations where, you know, a long pole with a, a hook on the end and somebody hanging out over the end. Me, because, you know, that it was, it was several years ago when I wasn't the biggest person on there. I didn't make the best anchor. And the other person holding on to me and somebody else holding on to them and uh, pull it over and grab a handful of fruit um, before we go down the ravine. Uh, so I love it. I'm hoping we're going to get fruit on ours out here. We've got three from this collection planted together. Um, the, this is from 2016 seed. That was on uh, Tianmushan. Uh, where Calicanthus chinensis is found, but really cool viburnum. I I, I like this. Um, the in China the fruit hangs on for a long time uh, because I saw it in fruit the first time in 2008 in the spring, mm -hmm. and so it, it it had hung on all winter. Uh, of course, during the Cultural Revolution, a lot of birds got eaten, so um, there aren't as many birds out there. So. The birds are coming back in the last 10 years. Now when I go out, I hear more birds in China than I ever did before. That's great. All right, and lastly, a palm. I love palms. This is a hybrid uh, between uh, Trachycarpus fortunii wagnerianus, the, what they call the waggy fern, um, which has very stiff uh, 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 fronds and uh, Trachycarpus nanus, a little dwarf um, uh, windmill palm that doesn't get a big, um, big stalk. Uh, that's, you know, you always wonder when you get seed of hybrid palms, because um, palms mostly come true from the parent plant. Uh, but when you look at this growing, this is not Trachycarpus nanus, and it isn't Trachycarpus uh, fortunii wagnerianus. So you have to assume that it is indeed a a hybrid. These have been slow as nails, is that slow as molasses. Mm -hmm. um, oh, well, not so much. I was th we had an earlier crop of these. These are just um, a, a couple years old. So actually, they've been pretty fast. Um, but uh, you know, I think these are going to. It's going to wind up being a really cool plant. I don't know if it's going to be a tall tree, I, like a Trachycarpus fortunii, or if it's going to stay shorter. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, all the, the, the fronds are doing this, are cut very close down to the center part, this costa. So um, I think it's going to give a really neat texture in the garden. Whew. So I'm ready to answer any questions people might have about this, about the auction. Um, Chris will have to read the questions to me, but uh, I will say the auction closes after our uh, symposium on um, Saturday, so it'll close about uh, 4.30. We'll give some time after the symposium for, you know, people who want to make last-minute bids. So for everyone with questions, I believe we got them all during the chat, during the presentation. So if you asked one before and we missed it, please ask it again. Otherwise, all new questions are being um, answered right now. Right. And, um, you know, if you've looked at the list that we have online uh, and you have questions about anything else, you know, I'm happy to answer those and happy to answer any questions about our symposium, our speakers. Well, we've got a, a good question from Chris again. Are there any other fruit trees in the auction? I can't think of one myself but I didn't study it as I much as I can't you think of one. I know that as soon as 
go to put these back in the the nursery. I'm like, oh yeah, that one. Oh well, you're not gonna like the, how the fruit tastes, but the one dogwood does um, produce an edible fruit. I think you may have mentioned that one, but yeah, it may not have been acknowledged as much as the persimmon. Yeah, yeah, yes, and and uh, Kathy just mentioned, of course, the oh, is there a pomegranate? I don't think we have any pomegranates. Okay, so it's just the persimmon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dick has asked, how tall does the trachycarpus get? Well, one parent gets, you know, 30 feet tall. Another one gets six or eight feet tall. So, so maybe between. somewhere in between. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Too new that we don't know yet. Yeah, I, yeah. I've never grown one of these um, out to maturity or anything. So. Um, it kind of looked like it had a uh, kind of a weepy feathery look to me yeah for the individual I mean, it looks like it's forming a, i mean it's definitely forming a trunk you know it's not like a, a sable, sable miner or something that's with a, a, a subterranean trunk it's it's definitely forming a trunk and pretty young so i think it's going to go up okay and hal just asked how hardy is the viburnum that you showed Okay, how hardy is the viburnum? The viburnum should be plenty hardy, should be zone six at least, maybe even co more cold hardy. That's what I would assume. Viburnum glomeratum is, is a pretty hardy viburnum. Uh, where it was collected um, is not high elevation, and it's, it's uh, so that can affect things, but Tian Mushan is a very odd place that um, a lot of things, um, that you would think should be growing much higher elevation, much more inland, much more cold places, uh, seem to grow for some reason. So, um, but I, I would think certainly zone six, but I would think even maybe even colder than that. Okay. We just had a, another fun one from Chris. She is asking how messy are some of the fruit if they would be messy? Are the fruit small enough that they really aren't too bad? On the on any of them? That would be like the persimmon and the dogwood. The persimmon, you know, I don't know that I would plant it uh, over a walkway or driveway. I think it could be messy in that sense. Um, the dogwoods, those are never really seem to be messy much. Um, so. You know, they kind of they kind of stay hard that, um, even when they fall off the tree. And so, you know, when you blow leaves or rake leaves or something like that, they kind of blow away. But no, I, I, I don't think messy. Okay. I, I gave that or attributed that question to the wrong person. That was Carolyn. Chris has asked the next question. She says, tell us about the uh, hydrangea in Valucrata. I'm blowing that one. Blue bunny. She said it looks lovely. Yeah, so hydrangea in Valucrata is a big hydrangea. Great big leaves, uh, great big growth habit. Uh, blue bunny or Wimrutin is a compact form of that, which by compact, that means it grows about five or six feet tall and eight or 10 feet wide. So like half the size of the parent. Um, it's, it's got big felted leaves, um, great big felted leaves. And then in uh, summer, kind of mid to late summer, it forms these big fat golf ball sized buds, which slowly open up to these big, massive lace cap, um, lavender lace cap flowers. Uh, we have it in our lath house, it's probably a terrible place for it. We really need to move it because it's way too big for the lath mm -hmm. house. Um, but people always want to know what it is. Uh, they love that plant. And that was the, oh, here we go. Can you talk about the loquat? That's from Mary Ann. Can I talk about the, oh yeah, there's a good fruiting plant. Forgot about that one. There, there you go. go, knew there would be one. So the loquat is one um, that I actually collected in um, Taiwan in 2008 from my first trip there. These are cuttings from our plant. Um, we've had ours planted out uh, since 2009, 2010 maybe. It's never had a problem. So loquats have big, uh, this one especially has big kind of silvery blue uh, leaves, new growth, very white on the back sides, kind of stiff leaves are very long, kind of turn dark uh, uh, blue green uh, as they mature. It's evergreen, it flowers, it's flowering right now um, with very fragrant flowers. These big fuzzy uh, brown buds open up to these clusters of kind of off-white flowers. 
and then it forms fruits, um, loquat fruits, which are delicious. Uh, most every year in um, Raleigh, those those fruits are uh, those uh, fruits that are being formed over the winter are killed by cold. The plant's fine. The fruits just um, don't make it through. We did these last two mild winters. We did have fruit on ours um, that came through. Uh, down on the coast, I often see big plants just loaded with with the fruit that turns orange. So there is another edible fruit in there. Uh, yeah, I love the loquat. Um, I I love it, uh, and it is. I've I talk to people, and people say, "Oh no, loquats are fine in Zone Seven. They're fine in Raleigh. They never have any problem." I've had a lot of problems with loquats, but never with this one. This is um, we were going to put a just call it Ralston Hardy, um, but people kind of convinced me not to because they they kept telling me it was no different than any other one. But I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. We we may wind up putting a name on it. Uh, maybe something more interesting than Ralston Hardy, but um, I do think it's a really good one. I'm waiting for one good cold winter to to really see. And would that require full sun? Um, if you want fruit, yeah, probably. Um, but you can grow it in high shade, like if you have pines that, uh, you know, kind of give you some filtered light, that they're fine in a spot like that but probably won't get much in the way of fruit. And that looks like it may have taken care of the questions in the chat, Mark. All right. Well, I hope many of you will join us on Saturday. Like I said, it's gonna be a, a really fun group of speakers. Um, I hope you'll check out our website, look at other um, fun stuff we have going on. If you're a member, you're already getting this. If you're not a member, um, you can sign up for our cuttings, which is what we send out with announcements of programs and things like that. Um, you can uh, you can do that on our website. Uh, Chris may be putting something in the chat to show you how to do that, but um, we love to share the information of what we're doing, and we're doing a lot, and a lot of it's um, vir uh, virtual. Uh, so you know, definitely check that out. And y'all have a happy uh, rest of the uh, rest of your Veterans Day.